Hello and welcome to On The Mark as we speed towards September. It is a big hello to our regular panellists, Kelly Underwood and Neralee Meadows. And tonight, a man who hopes he will be featuring in the finals action, Melbourne star Neville Jetta, who, of course, is one of the leading voices in the Indigenous community. It's an exhaustive setup, but eventually, Neville Jetta has it got the distance. It has, and for once, it's dead straight. Jack Dorr, and big grab, and he's taken Jetta right down as he's taken the mark. That was clever, Pal Pepper. What a tackle! That was a beauty. Neville, thank you so much for coming in and joining us. Huge game this week against the West Coast Eagles. And given everything that happened last year with missing out on finals, how tense is it at the club this week? Um, it's probably not as tense. We, we, we know what we need to do. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. So, obviously, it didn't go to plan last week against Sydney Swans. But, um, yeah, we'll just keep back in, in our game style and keep playing the way we want to play. Um, and hopefully things will take care of themselves. So you missed out by 0.05% last year. Was, remember it was that final game and West Coast beat the Crows over in the West. I remember running into Max Gorn the next morning and he said he watched it in his lounge room with all the lights off by himself with his hoodie on. Yep. What were you doing on that Sunday night as West Coast kicked away and knocked you out of the finals? Uh, yeah, so I was cooking dinner uh, for myself and my family and uh, had the chicken, had the vegetables going at the same time and I said to myself I wasn't going to watch it. And then uh, my wife told me the scores. I put my uh, phone up and started watching on the app. And uh, Lewis, my cousin, kicks a goal, I think, about four minutes ago. And uh, at that time, I turned the stove off and uh, rang up Domino's and, and ordered some pizzas. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you, and your in. cousin is to blame. He kicked the, he kicked he the goal. He pretty much, yeah, sort of sealed the, the door shut. So, uh, yeah, that was pretty much how my off-season started, pretty much. Have you spoken to him about it? Yeah, I've, I've pretty much rang him. He texted me that night, I reckon. And uh, <laughs> I didn't text evening? him back. I didn't text him back at all. Uh, next couple of days, just sort of said good luck for uh, sort of the rest of the season for him. Yeah. What would it mean to play finals? You've been at the club for such a long time now mm. and yet to play in one. What would it mean? Yeah, it's uh, been a, a long ride, uh, not only for myself, but Jonesy. Jonesy um, ended up playing one early in his career. Um, Gorney, Tom McDonald, these sorts of players that I've got to play with for a long time. Um, it's something that we've always strived to do. Um, obviously, uh, we've had a lot of coaches, a lot of players go through, a lot of turnover. So to be able to play finals, um, yeah, be that sort of icing on it, the cake. It's pretty remarkable. It's 136 AFL games. It's 10 years in the system and, and you've never played a final like Narrowly said. Does, does it keep you awake at night? Uh, probably not as much as my kids do. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, Good answer. But, uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's something that when I walk into the footy club, it's definitely... Um, yeah, life's that fire to be a better player, but then also improve my teammates around me. So tell us about 2013. You say that you've, you've personally had a long journey, delisted, given a rookie um, contract after yep. that, and you were pretty much out the door back home to WA as far yep. as you were concerned. What changed and what, what was the penny that dropped for you? Uh, probably, obviously, that year um, I, got to, I was training as a back. Um, and then my first game back into that senior side was was as a forward, as a small forward. And uh, obviously, me as a forward didn't work out. Um, um, and uh, yeah, my form wasn't great. Um, got sent back to Casey to to yeah, just improve. Obviously, at that time, I, I felt myself that my name um, almost had a black mark through it. Um, to say you tried every spot, yeah, you you ain't performing. Um, like you should, and um, so I, I started to concentrate on life after football. I started working at the Richmond Football Club. Um, they had a Laguntas program, which is a football program. Um, myself and Dustin Martin was, was working with these boys, 15, 16, uh, that are trying to sort of uh, forge a career in the TAC Cup and then hopefully further on into the AFL. So uh, I was probably working there maybe two, two and a half days a week out of our schedule that we, that we get um, and really invested my time into, into that sort of organisation and um, through that my footy started to pick up. Um, obviously a lot of boys say that um, once you sort of get your off-field stuff sorted, footy starts to take care of itself and that's probably the release I needed and started playing some real good football at VFL level and um, I was able to get that opportunity uh, in the last game of the year to play on Luke Dowhouse and um, I obviously 
the story said Rosie's in the grandstands watching me and um, a full body cramp in the last quarter because I'm chasing Luke Dowhouse, who is an unbelievable runner and um, footy player. And uh, um, yeah, put my best foot forward. And um, obviously, Aaron Davey was on the way out. That was his last game for the football club. And I felt like that was almost my last game as well. And um, yeah, off season coming around, had my exit meetings and stuff like that. And we spoke about uh, there's a chance to be on the rookie list. And but uh, at the time, me and my wife were speaking about um, the options option A, option B, option C. and um, Probably the one that we probably felt like was to get back home um, was probably the best one for me and Nalani, my daughter at the time, and Samantha, um, who, yeah, I just wanted to be able to to make sure that I had a probably a more steady job um, and they had a bit more security around that and um, and not me feeling like I, I'm still trying to pursue my dream and, and be a bit selfish in terms of that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it was a bit of me trying to be not selfish and worry about my own career, but um, more uh, make sure that they are okay. And um, it was actually my wife, Samantha, said, give it one more crack. Um, it could be another year, 12 months down the track. Um, thank goodness And then we can did. still go back home. And, um, yeah, and like I said, thank, thank goodness we did. And I'm still here uh, about five, six years later. So, mm. Tell us about the work you're doing with Melbourne and the uh, Reconciliation Action Plan. You're yep. very much a leader in... Uh, in Melbourne and also working with our young Indigenous players. How important is that for you? Yeah, it's um, the wrap uh, was um, put together last year. We had um, Aaron Davey, as you see on the screen, uh, myself, Austin Wanamiri, Liam Jarra come down and to, to have something in place that um, the players, Indigenous players, can come into the footy club and know that these things are in place already. It definitely makes you feel a lot more um, at home within a footy club and uh, to be able to be a part of that um, is something, yeah, I'm very proud of and to be able to um, create change within our footy club is something um, I'm looking forward to continue to do throughout my time in uh, Melbourne Footy Club. Um, and like I said, have those players come back. It's, uh, it, was a, it was a good day uh, to see their faces again and, and sort of talk about old times. They were very popular Melbourne players, weren't they? So I think the Demon fans yeah. loved having, having them there. Yeah, no, they, uh, like I said, they, in the short time that Liam played and Austin played, uh, some of their highlights are a um, lot, lot bigger than mine. I've played 136 <laughs> games and these folks have kicked only 200 goals. So. so tell us about your dad because yep. he was a part of the, the stolen generation and that's really instilled a, a real passion in you to, to want to share the, you know, the story of the Noongar people and, yep. and the cultural background that you have. Tell us about your dad. Yeah, so he's one of 14. Um, grew up in a... or was born in a country town in... Uh, Calabaran in Western Australia, about two and a half hours, three hours east of Perth. Um, and from, I think he might have been nine or ten, was, uh, him and his brothers and sisters were taken away, um, told um, uh, that their parents didn't want them no more and taken to Perth and, um, yeah, put through all different um, boys' homes. Um, my dad ended up in a, in a prison as well throughout Perth and... Um, yeah, it was a, obviously a tough time for him and, and his brothers and sisters, and they were all separated all over, all over Western Australia. So um, he was there till 15, 16 years old and um, finally let out um, to be with his elder sister, um, who was uh, living on a farm at the time. And, um, but to have someone um, to, like that to be my father is something that, um, yeah, definitely instilled that resilience within myself to be able to achieve my goals because um, pretty much from the time I was born with me and my uh, siblings, he did all he could to support us. Um, and it was a bit of, uh, um, uh, I'm not um, worry, uh, I probably would say worry about us being taken away if he did anything wrong. So uh, growing up, he was always um, real hard on us as children. Um, couldn't be out any later, like 10 o'clock sundowns, you're inside um, and yeah, just wanted to, for us to be the best people we could be and alcohol and, and drugs and stuff like that was just excluded um, from uh, yeah, our family and was really proud upon through him and, and sort of his hard stance. Am I right in saying you were with him when Melbourne official, officials came knocking on your door the very first time to make contact? Yeah, so um, before the draft, uh, myself, mum and dad, we all spoke about um, yeah, just trying to escape what's going to happen, mm. um, potentially going to happen. And I didn't know I was getting drafted at all, but uh, 
We were about 300 k's, 400 k's east of Perth and um, out in the middle of nowhere. You and your dad? Me and my dad, my younger brother, were out hunting uh, kangaroos that I still do to this day to sort of escape this world I'm living in at the moment. And um, yeah, we're out there. Uh, we're out there about three or four days, and then we get this. I, I somehow get a uh, message through on my Nokia 3310 that I had back <laughs> in the day. And I, um, yeah, it's uh, Barry Prendergast at the time. I get a message from him saying, Hey, mate, we're in Bunbury, we need to catch up with you. Um, yeah, looking forward to, yeah, whatever happens. And uh, yeah, so we 300 k's away, we ring mum, fly back, back to Bunbury, and we've got all this kangaroo meat that we've just hunted for two or three days in the boot and uh, we're flying back, get about 100 k's from Bunbury and our car breaks down. <laughs> um, so we're, uh, we're sitting there on the side of the road, we ring up uh, my cousin Lewis, who's um, sitting there with my mum and the uh, recruiters and... Uh, he wasn't trying to cut your lunch, was he? And... Oh, he probably would have. Yeah. Uh, but, we, yeah, we knew how good Put a player... Put his hand up for the demons. We knew how good a player he was. Yeah. Um, and he's needed opportunity. And, uh, yeah, we've seen how good, he, good he's become. And uh, But, yeah, we rang his dad. His dad come picked us up about 100 k's out and drove us back. And uh, I think we made him wait maybe 48 hours to actually get that one meeting that went for 20 minutes. So, uh, so was the kangaroo meat OK or was it no, spoilt by the no, end of that? it was gone. Oh. So, um, yeah. Now, I spoke to, to the club and, yeah. and a lot of people at the club have, have described you as the most understated, reliable person who gives back to the community like no one else. They've never seen anyone put in the hours that you do outside yeah. of what the club asks for. I'd never even heard that about you. Tell us about all these roles and, and why you're so inspired because they gave me a list here and it's about seven different things yeah. that you do weekly. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's probably... Obviously, I, I grew up in a community where everyone helps each other. Um, Indigenous community um, where things were hard to come by at times and everyone sort of leaned on each other and, and that's probably where that comes from. But um, it's also... Growing up in WA, it's always hard to see an AFL player because they're so flat out and there's so, so much of a state for these players to get around to. Um, to be accessible is something that I, I uh, probably pride myself on, is, is to be able to give back where I can and to show that we are human. Obviously, we're on TV and, and stuff like that, but to be accessible and, and to be able to, to connect with people and to show them that, um, yeah, I'm a footy player, but I still have the same um, yeah, challenges in my life as some of you guys do, um, whether it be on the field or off the field. Um, and something that I'll be able to probably prop myself and be able to do is get out there and connect and um, yeah, it's probably helped my footy as well um, and probably helped me more to be a better father, a better, a better person. So, so on, oh, sorry, on that, um, Adam Goods did an interview a couple of weeks ago on the ABC and spoke about what he went through. Mm -hmm. um, it, it certainly makes a lot of us f feel ashamed, I think. Well, I certainly feel that way. How did you feel through that time? And, and I know you watched that interview. How did you feel watching the interview? Yeah, it was pretty hard, obviously, um, to see him playing and playing against him and, and the stuff that was directed towards him. Uh, it was, yeah, definitely tough as an Indigenous player who have, have connected through our Indigenous camps over the years and, um, and to sort of feel helpless was probably the hardest thing. Um, but then the, the messages that he continues to, to put out there is he's all about the future and wanting to move forward and, and finding um, a way to work together is something that I probably took out of that and to continue to, to not only um, put that message through him but put it back on the other people that, that I've probably thrown a bit of stuff towards him. Yeah, well, you've had six coaches in ten years, which yeah. is extraordinary. Dean Bailey, Viney, Neild, Craig, Paul Rose and now Simon Goodwin. Which one's had the most influence on your career? Um, obviously, Rusey um, probably gave my career back to me. Uh, but uh, early on, Dean Bailey was, was a big impact. Uh, on my career and, and me as a person, he, um, yeah, he almost, um, as I say, he was a very sort of caring, sort of nurturing sort of coach person. Uh, I definitely felt that uh, being a young player coming across from WA as an 18 year old, and um, obviously, Rusey, as I got older, to be able to help me perform at my best on field. Um, and then, obviously, that's carried on to, to Simon as well. And how challenging was that first year? Such a big move, obviously, from one side of the country to the other. But that, your first year was 2009. So Jim mm. Steins was diagnosed with cancer that year. The yep. team got the wooden spoon. They got the priority pick. Um, you know, there was the tanking controversy as well. Yeah. How did you get your head around that first 12 months in the system? Um, 
oh, they're probably you're, you're so excited to be in an AFL system. Um, a lot of things just fly over your head, and um, I had some pretty good company um, teammates around me. Um, Aaron Davy, Matthew Whelan at the time, and um, I had a host family out at Sky that I was living at the time. But I reckon I spent maybe 90% at Aaron Davy's house, um, and he had a granny flat um, at the back of his place as well. So he had a one-bedroom flat that had myself, Austin Wanamiri, Liam Jarrah, Jamie Bunnell, all in the one spot pretty much most weekends. So, um, yeah, we leaned on each other a lot and, um, yeah, definitely caught, like, we pretty much caught ourselves the brothers in, within the group um, and we had a lot of support around us and everyone leaned on each other because um, if you didn't do that, yeah, it would have been a lot harder to be. Um, within the footy club and trying to perform. And you grew up barracking for St Kilda and uh, your idol was one of the greatest Indigenous mm. plates we've ever yep. seen in Nicky Winmar. Tell us about what attracted you to the Saints. Yep, so obviously the Saints, I was playing pretty much from my dad. Uh, he went for the Saints and then uh, once Fremantle came in, then I jumped ship to, to Frio and uh, all the Indigenous players that they had uh, early on and, um, and then also the Wiz coming across. But um, to have Nicky... Uh, who's a family member uh, through my dad's side playing. Um, it's definitely uh, inspired me as a football player and, and the rest of our community to have someone um, held on such a pedestal and to, to be able to achieve what he achieved in his career. Um, yeah, definitely inspired not only myself, but Lewis and, and the rest of our family to not only do good things on the football field, but off as well. Well, you're inspiring the next generation of Indigenous stars at the moment and no doubt inspiring your gorgeous son, uh, Kyrie, who's come in here to uh, Fox Footy today. He's going to come up and say a quick hello because we think he is a megastar in the making. Gorgeous little boy. Three years old, yeah? Yep, three years old. And uh, is he, is a, big fan of, a big fan of Bernie Vince as well. Yeah, he loves Bernie. Who's that? Can you see track on the, on the TV? <laughs> now, you've got a dog, don't you? What's his name? What's your dog's name? Do you know what the dog's name <laughs> Bernie. Bernie. Bernie, that's right. After your favourite player, and is he a bit like Bernie as, as a person as well? Yeah, he's a bit naughty, isn't he, sometimes? <laughs> yeah. Likes to stay up late. Yeah, but he's very, a lot of fun, isn't he? Bernie's a lot of fun. Yeah, but was he doing Oz Kick? You're meant to be five, aren't you? And yeah, he's doing Oz Kick, so already. he's, um, yeah, got into myself and his mum to, to take him down. And um, yeah, he's, uh, I think his first game he kicked about five goals. He wouldn't pass it oh, off. So. Oh, and he's three. And we asked him, he needs a handball, and he told me um, it's, it's uh, Oz Kick, not Oz Handball. Oh, that's so. <laughs> so, so, yeah, he could come back straight away with a quick reply. So we're like, oh, we'll just keep hitting goals. <laughs> Sounds like he's going to be a small yeah. forward, not yeah. a defender. <laughs> Kyrie, will you come back and talk to us in like 20 years' time when you're a superstar years. for the Demons? Yeah. If we're all around. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so Good much stuff. for coming in. No uh, it's been lovely yeah. to meet your gorgeous son and, yeah. and have a great chat no to you. Well done well on done. the work that Thank you are you. doing. Jeez. All Thank right, you. next up, Nerily chats to a man with the toughest job in football, running the Gold Coast Suns. Are you in it for the long haul? Absolutely. You don't come to do this just uh, uh, for a short run, particularly when you know that it's not about a six or a 12 month turnaround. This is about building something that um, becomes exciting over a period of time.